Rob Hopkins is the founder of the Transition Movement, an idea that began in 2008 and since then has gone viral around the world. It's been called the biggest urban brainwave of the century, a visionary practical blueprint that took root in a town and is circling in the globe. The Transition Movement is founded on the principles of permaculture, gardening techniques modeled after natural ecosystems. At its heart, is the idea of a plan imagined by the community, designed by the community, and implemented by the community to move the community away from fossil fuels and into a rich, sociable, locally focused way of life. As transition takes hold, communities increasingly produce their own goods and services, curb the need for transportation, and take other measures to prepare for a post-oil future. The term community here includes all the key players, local people, local institutions, local businesses, and local government. Two years after its founding, the transition movement had spread to more than 400 towns all over the world in Britain, Ireland, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, Italy, and Chile. Rob Hopkins himself now works for an organization that he co-founded called the Transition Network, whose purpose is to inspire, encourage, connect, support, and train communities as they self-organize around the transition model, creating initiatives that rebuild resilience and reduce CO2 emissions. The world's very first transition town was the lovely little city of Totnes, Hopkins' hometown, a market town with a population of about 7,400 in South Devon, England. And that's where we found him. Well, the transition town movement is a, resp uh, a collection of ordinary people around the world motivated by climate change, by peak oil, by what the economic crisis that we're facing. and arguing that what we need to do is to build community resilience, that the thing that will get us through this, or one of the things that will get us through that is community resilience, and we need to see that as an enormous opportunity. So when people talk about climate change, there's so many things we need to do, and they often feel like something terrible, or we're moving away from where we want to be. In transition, we say there's an enormous opportunity here for an economic, a cultural, and a social renaissance in the places that we live. So transition's really, about ordinary people being fantastic, I think, in extraordinary times, about unleashing the collective genius of a place to respond to these times. Mm. And what would that mean in, in sort of specific terms? I mean, let's assume that we have gone through what looks like a pretty critical few years, and at the other end of it, the transition towns have, have come out in a world where the climate's quite different and peak oil is, is clearly there. What, what, what would we see in a town? What would like we that? see? I think what you would see would be a, a much more localized economy. So at the moment, we use an enormous amount of fossil fuels and energy to transport things all around the world. And at the same time, our local economies are unraveling and being dominated by corporate. Uh, businesses who then suck the profits out to distant investors, I think we really argue that the future will be one which is m much more inherently local, where, where possible, local food supplies meet local needs, locally generated energy is in community uh, ownership, uh, where we use local building materials where appropriate, uh, where our local economies are much more vibrant and designed to enable much more money to cycle locally and not be leaving and pouring out to different places because I think when we look at the scale of the cuts we need to make in terms of climate change sometimes people imagine that we can achieve that just by increased vehicle efficiency changing our light bulbs and you know putting some wind turbines up we would argue that actually the change required is much much more profound and needs a rethink of the scale on which we do our everyday lives mm -hmm. and uh, is it is it possible to well I think maybe one part of the reason people feel that there's a there's a loss in this prospect is that there are things that in a place like Totnes you just simply couldn't get right that uh, all of a sudden bananas would be off the menu for example and so on. I mean, we're, no, we're, we're not talking about self-sufficiency. It's not that we're, it's nothing about putting up a big fence around a place and not letting anything in or out. You know, we're doing a big piece of work here in Totnes at the moment, which we call the Economic Blueprint, which is the first time I know that anyone's mapped the economy of a place uh, and then is able to argue financially the benefits of, of localization. So here, for example, this town spends about £31 million every year on food, of which about 24 goes out through just two supermarkets. So we're able to say, and this town has a much bigger local food economy than most other places do. So there's all this money pouring through this town 
and none of it really staying here. So we, it means we can say, look, if we can just shift 10% of our spend as a community to local food, that's two and a half million pounds comes into this community that we can use to create skills, employment, training, livelihoods. And that's a really powerful idea, I think. That's a really big idea that we need at this time uh, in, in, in history. So it's not about self-sufficiency. There's always been trade, there always will be trade. But at the moment, for example, the UK exports one and a half million kilos of potatoes to Germany every year and imports one and a half million kilos of potatoes from Germany every year. And that same thing goes on around the world. And so we're really saying we don't have the luxury to do that anymore. We need to be a bit more sensible about how we do things and work on a more appropriate scale. And coming back, come back to resilience, because I think that if there were one word I had to use to ex to to express what I know about the movement, I think that would be the word. Mm -hmm. um, why is that so important? Because I think in the sustainability movement, we often uh, our mental picture is that we're trying to move towards something which is a kind of a steady state or something which is sustainable in the long term, kind of smooth and predictable and. Whereas actually, increasingly, we're moving into times of shocks. You know, we've seen this summer in the UK, it's been the wettest summer on record, loads of terrible for farmers. In the US, it's been the opposite. You know, the, it's, we're entering a time where, where you might have oil shocks, crisis-induced uh, issues, economic uh, crisis-related issues. So we're not in a steady state. We're in a time where actually, alongside sustainability, we need to be designing for shock. How do we build into what we do the ability to be flexible uh, in terms of that shock and that we don't just fall to bits. The, uh, there was a football manager here in the UK called Ian Dowie who used to describe resilience as bounce back ability and I think what we need to do is to design bounce back ability into what we're doing uh, at every step because these are not predictable uh, times that we're moving into at all and I think resilience is a really really useful framing for that and, and I think the thing about resilience as well is that Sustainability is kind of inherently a good thing, whereas resilience, you could have a good form of resilience, and there have been societies in the past that have been resilient, but you really, really wouldn't want to live in them. So I think what Transition is trying to do is to say, uh, is to try to model a really good kind of positive version of what resilience would look like. Well, in a way, you know, you, you, you don't, uh, we will have to be resilient, and we probably will be resilient, but you're quite, quite right, we may be resilient in some very dumb ways if we're still in denial about some of the realities that we're going to be facing. Yeah, I mean, we've done lots of oral history work, for example, you know, because Transition talks about local food and local economies and supporting independent traders. Sometimes people say, oh, you just want to take us back. We just want to take us back in the past, you know, as if you could even do that anyway. But, you know, you want to take us back in the past to some idyll that you've cobbled up out of bits of history you know well actually in this town we've done lots of oral history talking to people from the 1940s the 1950s which was the last time arguably when this place was much more resilient after the war virtually all the food consumed here was locally produced there were market gardens in the town that grew local food there was lots of local businesses processing businesses and so on and actually when you talk to people from that time you get a sense of the things that made it resilient and the things that really didn't you know there were things that were really good that we would want to take forward with us into a more uh, resilient uh, low carbon future but there were lots of other things that we'd really be best to leave behind there. You know, it may have been more resilient, but it certainly didn't in in encourage innovation. It, there was no diversity. It was not a very tolerant. It was very conservative. You know, there are those kind of things that actually we d we can leave behind. And there's a danger, isn't there, inherently that that when you're shocked, that you will turn back to the familiar. You will not, you know, rather than seeing the opportunity. This may be one of the really key things about transition is that is that seeing it as an opportunity gives you a chance to innovate and move forward and think about other alternatives, whereas the normal sort of reaction to a shock is to pull back a little bit and hunker down in what you had in the first place and try to hold on. Yeah, and I think that, that's the role of transition. That's why transition to me is so important, because uh, what I see here after six years of doing transition and many other places that I go to is that what transition does. I, when we started doing transition, I thought it was an environmental process. That was how I conceptualized it. But now I really see that it's a cultural process. It's about how do you change the culture of a place to be ready for times of, of rapid change. So, uh, so and, and one of the things I think that's distinct about transition is that it shifts away from uh, the focus of the environmental movement, which is so often on probabilities. What's the probability of this, the probability of that? To the, to the realm of possibilities. What's possible that we can create from this situation? Here we are. 
You know, this is the situation. Well, what, you know, what, what, what are we going to do here? And part of that is about storytelling. A lot of what transition does is to tell stories about the possibilities of where we go from here, what other people are doing. And uh, Ted Hughes, the English r poet and writer, used to write about how uh, God used to take clay and make animals into shapes and, bl and blow into them and then they would fly away. And I think similarly, transition is like, it kind of breathes possibility into the place where it is. Uh, so that actually then, for me, that's really what the where the resilience comes from. That when you encounter times of shock, people have, uh, have an instinctive sense of what's possible in that time and what they could create out of that time. And they feel, they, they feel um, emboldened to actually do something rather than just be very passive with it. That in itself is a huge, huge change if you, if you can persuade people to think that change means possibility. Yeah, I always remember one time in, uh, in Totnes, in fact it was when George Monbiot's article came out saying that peak oil was rubbish, someone came up to me looking rather down, downcast and said, is it true that peak oil's not an issue anymore? Because that would be terrible, then we can't do all that really cool stuff we were wanting to do. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know I think actually it's one of the things that, <coughs> that Transition has done is to, is to, is that people, which really wasn't there before, you know, it was sort of grew into a vacuum in that when we started being interested in peak oil and, and what do we do about it, all there was on the internet was great big hairy guys in America heading off up into the mountains with uh, shotguns and four years worth of baked beans and toilet paper as their response to peak oil, you know, and actually there wasn't anything that was said, well, maybe we need to do this together and actually maybe we need a response which is compassionate and which builds community. And, uh, and so that feels like a, the, the really important thing that, that, that Transition has contributed. It builds a sense of anticipation about the possibility of what we can do from here. Because that's the only way we're going to get there. That, you know, people expect government are going to do this for us, but government aren't going to do it if, nobody, if there's absolutely no pull from people. You know, we, want to, we want to do this. This is where we see our future as being. And you start to see that happening here and in other places now. It becomes the story people tell about the future of the place. It's interesting, isn't it, that like so many stories that you need about the future, the story is there in the past too, and in other ways, I mean, uh, the whole idea that, that, that our security is in one another is surely one of the big lessons of the Blitz, for example, the whole Second World War. Yeah, absolutely, and I think there's a huge, and, and also I think the idea that you can, I think if, if the other lesson of that time is that if government wants to turn things around very quickly, you know, the, the public education campaign during the Second World War in terms of reducing consumption, growing your own food, we're all in this together, all that kind of thing is, is an extraordinary thing and how they how they also uh, dealt with with food security in this country which before the second world war was the was the worst it had been for a long long time and how they turned that round and urban agriculture and growing food everywhere that whole culture was was extraordinary i think yeah. and people remember it with considerable warmth and i mean they obviously didn't like bombs falling on them but when they talk about the way people were together and the way the community felt and so forth they they tend to speak about it very warmly they do, and I think they also tend to point out that one of the key reasons why they feel about it warmly was because everyone was there was a sense that everyone was in it together. So there wasn't the sense like now where, where people on low incomes are expected to take the full brunt of austerity while they still see Roman Abramovich in his yacht with its rocket launchers on the top, you know. And uh, that's, um, those two things alongside each other is a recipe for disaster. Whereas I think during the war, there was a sense that, that the same restrictions applied across the board. Mm. We're all suffering deeply. One of the brilliant things I think about transition is, is the insight that, um, I, think it's, I think it's in, your, in one of your books at some point, that you said how people individually feel, uh, well, what can I do? And they're told you can change your light bulbs. And they, they're quite conscious that at some gut level that that's ridiculously inappropriate in scale <laughs> to the problem. Uh, and on the other hand, you can have governments doing something about it, if only they would, but generally they won't. Uh, and so you feel quite um, hobbled, you, know, you feel as though you really can't do anything. And suddenly you have this insight that you can do something at the community level. Uh, that's an incredibly empowering thing as well. Yeah, it is. And, uh, and, um, uh, and I think it's the great untapped resource in the, in the war against climate change really mm. you know because so many of the solutions require massive infrastructural change or like you say just changing our light bulbs 
but the potential of communities when they come together is extraordinary. You know, we see now after six years of, of transition, we have communities that have created their own community energy companies funded by shares rain raised from local people. We have cities establishing their own local currencies with the support of the local council. Uh, we've got um, you know incredible local food projects going on, incredible sort of inward investment initiatives. Communities really starting to be very strategic about how this whole thing works and my experience of transition has been that there is a real serendipity to the process that actually when you need when you think what we need now is somebody who can oh hello you know the, the, actually the people tend to sort of come along so here in here in Totnes for example there's about 40 projects that have been started since since transition time Totnes started and uh, and in many, many times, actually, the right people just come along at the right time with the expertise that, that, that's needed. Communities are incredibly resourceful things. And we have this idea, or we've been fed this idea, that if we want to make change happen, we have to wait for the coachload of experts to come in and get off with their clipboards and walk around and write us a plan and go away again. And transition is a real challenge to that. It says, actually, what we need is already here. And it's just a question of having a process that unlocks it and that engages people. It's a, it needs to be a process that doesn't feel that it belongs to the left. It doesn't need to belong that it belongs to the right. Doesn't you know? It can encompass a, all kind of spectrums. It's about this place at this time in history, and what's the most appropriate thing for us to do moving forward. And that's a process that needs all of us, and it needs to be done in such a way that it invites us to be innovative and to be brilliant and to and to work together. Which raises the question of, of what's the community? How do you define the community? You know, who does it include? Who does it exclude? Does it exclude uh, business, for example? And, and what, are the, what are the boundaries? I mean, you have some, some transition projects in London neighborhoods, which must leak seamlessly into the adjoining neighborhoods, mm. you know? Well, it's, I think we always say that, that your neighborhood is what you feel your neighborhood is. You know, it could just be your street. It could just be your building. It could be your workplace. Usually, usually it's a it's um, it's a it's a it's an area that has a you know if someone says where are you from you know that's usually the well I'm from Tooting or I'm from Totnes or you know generally people people might say they're from London but often they would say I'm from Camden or you know from the particular part where they feel right. and usually those places have a culture and identity so we really say it's up to people to establish what's the area over which they feel they can have an influence if you take on too big an area you're going to burn out very quickly well for us it's up to the community itself to determine what 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 its neighborhood is and what the boundaries are that it's working within and by necessity those boundaries are going to be fuzzy and you may have a few different transition initiatives and sometimes they might overlap a little bit um, <coughs> but certainly the aim of transition initiatives is to try and engage as many people as possible from as widely across the community as possible. And that involves working with the council, that involves working with the local business community. Here in Totnes, for example, the economic blueprint that we're doing here, which is this really innovative piece looking at the local economy and how to relocalise here, is actually written by Transition Town Totnes, but it's actually the town council's blueprint supported by the district council, supported by the chamber of commerce, the local colleges, other local organisations. So that just within six years we've got to a stage where actually we are now, uh, we're sort of part of the fabric in that sense of, of the community here. We're not seen as something that's on the right, that's something that's on the left, that's something that's anti-capitalist or pro-capitalist, whatever. We're Transition Town Totnes, so we're looking at those kind of solutions and responses and that's what we see with transition uh, in many other places as well. So, for example, in Tooting in London, which is a very, very diverse part of London, they came to us early on uh, in doing transition there and said, Rob, we're in Tooting and it's really diverse, and very high levels of poverty and so on in, in London. How do we do transition there? And I said, I have absolutely no idea. Yeah, but when you figure it out, do let us know. You know, we'd love to know the story. So one of the first things that they went off and did was something called the Trash Catchers Carnival which is a huge street carnival uh, where everything in it was made out of waste and recycled materials. They used a million plastic bags and old crisp packets. They used tons of old this, that and the other. They made beautiful, beautiful things out of all this rubbish. They used, there was a thousand uh, people from local mosques and schools and temples who were part, who built all this stuff and then were part of the procession. About 10,000 people came out to, to come and watch it. It was an incredible kind of a celebration, but that came from that place, from those people, and it reflected that. 
transition in the next borough across in London might look very, very different, be focusing on very, very different things. Because actually the change that we need to make now needs to bubble up from the ground up. And government can't do that. It's too broad brush. You know, actually what transition does is try to stimulate that, that, uh, that, that activity at the local level so that it feels owned and, uh, 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 by everybody in that place. And you seem to be able to draw on the inventiveness of all kinds of people that probably didn't even think of themselves as being inventive. Hmm? Yeah, I think, I, think, uh, I think part of one of the side effects of the oil age, although there's been many, many wonderful things uh, and experiences that we've been able to have during the age of cheap oil, it's brought us many, many things. But I think it's also moved us further and further apart from each other. And it's also picked up many of the things that we instinctively did for each other, entertain each other, tell each other stories, do things with each other. It's kind of picked those up and sort of uh, kind of privatized those. And they've become something that then gets sold back to us again. So uh, uh, one of the things I love about transition is that, is that it stimulates so many different activities. But actually, if you ask people who are doing those activities, do you believe in peak oil and climate change? They probably may or may not. You know, it's really they feel part of something exciting in the community, which is really uh, which they want to be part of celebrating. Yeah, it's like bringing community back to life, as a yeah. you know, after yeah. a period of sort of dormancy when it's been um, you, when the economy has kind of taken over what used to be just life. Which is why I really kind of resist the idea that that uh, that. Uh, a lower carbon world is going to be some sort of wretched, miserable, you know, the, the st statistic I always use in talks here is that if we're going to avoid runaway climate change, it means that by 2050 the UK will have the carbon emissions that Mozambique has today. Okay, so if you go out on the street here and you say, can you imagine this town with a carbon footprint of Mozambique? Most people will imagine, you know, that they'll be sitting in a puddle eating rotten potatoes, you know. Whereas actually, uh, I think we can do an enormous amount better than that and that actually many of the things that, that if we can get it right and if we can really involve people and if we can really see the opportunities th 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 that are in that, actually there's almost a sense that we kind of emerge out blinking into the light and rediscover each other again and, and rediscover what our hands are for and it's not just for using the thumbs on, on our phones, you know, that actually uh, there is something really uh, valuable and, and, and life affirming about that, I think. Well, and in, in the past, we had carbon emissions that may have been closer to Mozambique than to today, right? I mean, if you go back to yeah. the 1920s or 30s, uh, we weren't using up you know, fossil fuels at this rate, we weren't generating carbon problems yeah. at this rate. Okay. No, and people's, people's reflections of those times are often that, that they were, well, I mean, obviously, you know, most people tend to look back at their childhood with a certain uh, wistful uh, uh, nostalgia. Um, but, f but for, you know, it, in many ways, you know, communities are much stronger. People looked out for each other. There wasn't this pressure to have the latest this, that, and the other. And you know, I don't, I, I you know, it won't be an easy uh, shift in direction because psychologically, when you've been used to having a bit more and a bit more, you know, if I give you five pounds more every month, you'd be saying thank you very much. If I start taking it away again, uh, you know, then you, then that's when you notice the change in direction, which is why. I think one of the bigger aspects of, of transition and one of the things that's also distinctive about transition is that it also says this is an inner as well as an outer process. This isn't just, we aren't going to get to where we need to get to so desperately. We aren't going to get there just by putting solar panels on the roof and growing carrots in our front gardens. You know, that's not, it's actually going to be an inner process as well because what we imagined was lying ahead of us what was awaiting for our children, for our grandchildren, isn't going to be what's actually waiting there. And it's that change in direction where we, where, which you are already seeing in Greece and Italy and Spain, uh, where people are taking a psychological battering with, oh, hang on, this, what, what, I, didn't, I didn't remember signing up for this. This isn't what I imagined. I thought I was, it was going to be very different, you know. And so actually tools and methods for giving people that personal resilience for those times where things change very rapidly is, is really important as well, I think, and often often neglected and overlooked in the environmental movement. Well, that's right. I, I think there's, there is a huge uh, um, psychological state, and yet when you, w when you press people to say, well, where is it going? When, when would you say enough, uh, based on the current pattern of heavy resource use and so on? 
it doesn't look very attractive where, where you'd be going with that. And the idea that you're going to a place where there's much more dense and rich human relationships is far more appealing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there was a speaker at the degrowth conference who said, you know, what I'm talking about at the moment might sound like utopia but act and, and unrealistic, but actually in 20 years' time, you'll be looking back at it and thinking, shit, I wish we'd done that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, actually things are moving so quickly. And actually, and, and, you know, and I meet people, politicians and people who decision makers, they haven't got a clue. You know, and actually I think, I think the, the solutions that are coming up from ordinary people through transition, the stuff they're already starting to do, you know, stories from all over the world of communities going, do you know what? We're not going to wait for permission on this anymore. We're just going to get on with it. And actually we need this, we need this, we need this. Let's just get on with it. And putting those things in place, you know, those stories are infinitely more useful and more appropriate than what our leaders are coming up with at this stage. Um, and uh, and that, feels, that feels really exciting to me. Well, that, and that is, is also one of the really impressive things <coughs> about the movement is that it seems, like I've heard people say, well, it's all very well in Totnes, which I gather is something of a bohemian town and has, you know, has a certain kind of countercultural character to it. Um, but, and, and, and it makes some sense that it would start here and it would work here, mm -hmm. but can you really transport that to, you know, some place in Brazil or some place in East London and mm -hmm. so on and so forth? And it seems as though the, the principles, you know, flower differently in these places, but, but it works everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I think, that, I think that we always designed it from the beginning to be self-organizing. It's not a Coca-Cola franchise, you know, it's something which is uh, where people, wherever they are, pick it up and there's enough that makes it recognizably transition and there's enough that gives them support in terms of doing it. But there's also a huge amount of scope, like with open source software, to pick it up, make it your own, adapt it, make it appropriate to the place. So transition in Bologna or Brixton or Brazil looks uh, very different in every place, but it's still recognizably transition. And that, I think, is one of the key ways, things, one of the key things that's enabled it to, to spread and, and, and go so far. So in Brazil, they've developed ways of teaching transition to people who can't read, uh, working in their favelas in Sao Paulo, uh, and all across Brazil in a whole range of different places, but it's it's theirs, you know, they've taken it and, and made it their own and that's that's fantastic. I remember one time I got asked to go and give a talk at this um, organization who, f who kind of fund social entrepreneurs, so it was this whole group of people who were who were successful entrepreneurs and in their kind of spare charitable time they look out for people with worthy ideas and then give them some, some support if they like them, you know, so I had to go along and give a pitch so I gave a pitch about transition to this room full of entrepreneurs <coughs> and they said, so hang on, wait a minute, so you've, you've created a brand and you've created a product and you've given it away for free and you don't have any control over what everybody does and they're all just off doing it and you don't make any money out of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they were like, well, what? what, what? It was totally out of the, you know, they were like, well, you should be doing this, you should be taxed for this and money for this. And, it's like, no, this is an idea and it's about trust and you give it away and people run with it. And people come to us at Transition Network and say, oh, so amazing, this transition thing and all the stuff you're doing. And, but all the things that they have in mind when they're talking about that, we don't do those things. People out in their places do those things. We, our role is to support that and inspire that and give them tools and resources to support them in doing that work. But the really exciting work is ordinary people in their spare time making this stuff happen. It's striking that, that tools seem to evolve as the thing goes forward. You start to evolve to, to create tools that um, um, allow you to measure things that you didn't think to measure before. I'm thinking, for example, of your uh, um, oh, what was it? Of your um, your oil audit, your oil impact audit. Tell yeah. me about that because it's a nice little example of you know, we're talking at a fair level of generality, but there's a nice specific example of what transition does with businesses. Yeah, well, that th that that came out of. The, again, this whole question of resilience, you know, how, how, if you're working with a business and you want to help a business become resilient, well, you need to, as a business to be able to work out where the shocks are. Where are you vulnerable? So if oil goes up to $147 a barrel like it did a few years ago, well, where do you become uh, vulnerable first? So at that time, that was the first time for about 30 years when it became cheaper for the US to start to make its own steel again rather than import it from China. You know, the economics start to change at $147 a barrel. 
So if you run a business, you want to know where oil price volatility, where oil price, I can't even say it, it's a bit early in the morning, where oil price volatility is going to impact your business. So we call it an energy resilience assessment or an audit. And basically what it does is it looks at where that business uses uh, fossil fuels either directly as, a, as, 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 a, as an energy source or as a feedstock or, as a, uh, or in transportation and so on. And then it builds up a picture of the business where you can then model it in terms of how the price of oil starts to impact, rises in the price of oil start to impact it. So we've done a few of those for, for different businesses and I think they find it really, really useful in identifying where the vulnerabilities are. We did one, for example, with a printer here in town who are printing 24-7, printing presses rolling, and I would have thought, well, it's obvious. You know, their oil vulnerability is the fact that, that, uh, that they print, that they use so much energy with the printing. Actually, the key, air, the key oil vulnerability they had was that all but one of their staff couldn't afford to live in this town, and they all lived about 10 miles away, had to drive in every day. And if the price of petrol got to a stage where their salary could no longer cover, justify the expense of driving into Totnes every day, they had no staff. So, so the, the, the lack of affordable housing in this town becomes a real issue in terms of oil vulnerability, as does um, uh, the need to actually train some local young people, which is what they then did as a result of it. They created an apprenticeship scheme for local young people. Not where you would have expected the vulnerability to show up. No, oh, not that's at all. A, that's, a complete, that's a complete surprise. I couldn't begin to guess where you were going. Yeah, I was fascinated with that. Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I presume it's full of surprises. You're having these kinds of things pop up all the time as people really seriously look at what the future might hold. Yeah, which is, which is why, for me, it's about... Which is why I've, I always kind of kick against that idea that in quite a lot of the peak oil literature that actually the end of the, en the, end of the age of cheap energy inevitably means uh, misery and, and, uh, and despair. You know, actually what we see through just that story about that energy resilience assessment is, is, a, is new opportunities. It's about shifting the thinking and then actually a huge possibilities start to open up. You know, if, you, if we start to look at making the local food economy here more resilient, so you're looking at then uh, you know, putting maybe back new market gardens around the towns, you're looking at linking local farmers up to local restaurants, the local food processing that used to be here in terms of milk processing, in terms of all those different things, that, that's all gone now. You, know, you start to put that back in place and that's what Transition Town Totnes is starting to do here, is really to say there is the opportunity here for a new economy for this town because the existing economy is very, very vulnerable very, very fragile. It's not about getting rid of it all, but alongside that economy, we need to be supporting the more resilient businesses that are here, the independent traders, rather than the corporate chain businesses. But we need to be building alongside that a new economy and culturing a, uh, uh, on new entrepreneurs and uh, that whole kind of a world. So that's really exciting. You start to see new opportunities for young people, new trainings, and that's that, that's that's what gets me out of bed every morning, actually, is the, is the possibilities that are inherent in all of this. Mm -hmm. And it all seems to intensify the, the sort of the density of communal relation, community relations, doesn't it? I mean, it, you know, you now have a printer. I didn't think that, that social housing was any part of his mandate. Yeah. And now all of a sudden he can see that, it's, that, that his own well-being uh, relies on things like social housing. Well, one of the th one of the big projects that we've done over the last couple of years is called Transition Streets, which is which w was developed here in Totnes and is now being rolled out to other places. And Transition Streets has been amazing in terms of uh, how do you make people, how do you support people to reduce their energy use? How do you support people to uh, build resilience in their own streets and in their own households? And Transition Streets works that you get out on your street, you knock on the doors, you get maybe six to ten of your neighbours together and you meet seven times in each other's houses and we have a workbook and the first week you look at energy, you look at water, you look at food. At the end of every session you make some pledges of things you're going to do before you meet again. And um, there are now 700 households that have done this programme here in Totnes. On average they cut their carbon by about 1.3, 1.4 tonnes each. Uh, and make various other kind of changes, save, so save themselves about £600 a year on, on their various bills. 
which has been hugely successful just in and of itself. And it won the Ashton Award for Behaviour Change last year, and it's been widely cited as a really vibrant model of, of what change looks like on a street by street level. But the most fascinating thing about it for me is that when I meet people here on the high street who've done it, they don't say, oh, Rob, do you know, it's fantastic. I've saved 1.3 tonnes of carbon. I'm so delighted. Actually, what they say is, do you know, it's brilliant. I now know this person, that person. I know Sandra down the end of the road. I didn't, I've never met her before. Do you know, she can do whatever. And uh, one of the uh, bits of research that was done at the end of Transition Streets and interviewed everybody and asked them, well, what was the benefit you got out of it? And so for me, coming as someone who's a, an activist around climate change, around peak oil, around resilience, I was thinking they'd say, well, I feel I've done my bit for climate change. Climate change doesn't even appear in their responses. What their responses are, the benefits I got out of this was getting to know my neighbours, feeling part of this community, feeling rooted in this place. And, uh, uh, and so then from that, all kinds of other things have emerged. So one, one street has set up a community cinema, one place has set up a community orchard, there's an electric bike scheme that's emerging out of this. So if, it's fascinating. It feels to me like what, the thing that I started to get a sense for that is maybe the best way to tackle climate change isn't to talk about climate change very much, is actually to, be, to bring people together and to build, and, and to build community in that way. Uh, and um, it's, it's, it's a bit like if you lose your keys in a, in, in the lights in, in a dark room, you know your keys are on the floor somewhere and you're looking around for your keys. If you look directly for things, you can't see them, but you see them by looking to one side and looking, seeing them out of the corner of your eye. And that feels, that was the, the sense I got from, from Transition Streets. That's a brilliant insight, isn't it? That, that uh, uh, I'm, I'm one, one thing that strikes me about that story is you you don't, you don't motivate people very well. One doesn't motivate people very well by saying you must do something about climate change. It's big, it's abstract, What's, you know, what can I do about it? And you know, the infrastructure is all set up for me to be wasteful and it's hard, you know. But if you motivate them by giving them those sort of warm human things, then that, that really does make them, you know, make them go forward. I'm, I'm reminded of one of the people we interviewed earlier was Chris Turner and, um, and Chris talks about the island of, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the island in Denmark, but where they were trying to, to shift, make a whole shift with respect to energy and wind power and, you know, they were going to be the uh, SAMSO. They were going to become the energy efficient island and so forth. And they did it by taking a cider press around the island and pressing people cider and buying people beer and then saying, this is what we're doing. And they would say, but we don't expect your community to get engaged with this because we recognize this will take, you know, things that you don't really have here, but we thought you should know about it and, you know, have another beer. And, and of course, people instantly got stimulated to say, "Well, why can't we do it?" And yes. and, uh, and and then uh, collectively, they went out and did exactly that sort of thing. But not, at no point were they ever really sort of saying, "Do your piece for energy uh, self-sufficiency" or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we have to be much more skillful about these things, and and I think often the the movement to do stuff about climate change and em environmental movement in general is often had a very low self-awareness about the ways in which it communicates these issues, the way that it looks, the way that it sounds, the language that it uses, and how for most people that's often quite a turn-off really, you know, and actually if you can do something where people, people, you know, we've just had the Olympics here, you know, the thing that people, are, who I, I, was, I wasn't around, I didn't go to any of it, but people I spoke to who did go to it said the thing they loved most was that it felt like a community, you know, people, people, they felt part of something bigger than themselves and about coming together with other people to celebrate something. And that's, that's what this change should be about, not some kind of miserable hair shirt sort of worthy, uh, worthy process about trying to be more austere than the next person. You know, I think the transition that we need to undertake, you know, Joanna Macy who writes about this stuff, she says the agricultural revolution took thousands of years and the industrial revolution took hundreds of years. This needs to take about 15 years, it's tw 20 years, you know, and actually if we do this, if we are actually able to uh, to avoid, to stay below two degrees of, of climate change and be ready for the end of the oil age and so on will be just the most staggering achievement. It'll be something our grandchildren will tell great stories about and sing great hearty, gutsy songs about, you know, and um, 
and we need to be skillful with how we do that and that we're only going to do it I think if it's something that feels celebratory it feels thrilling it feels like we're making history it feels like an invitation to be part of something that we'll sing those songs about I think that's the only way we're going to get there myself and that can't be done at a large scale, it can't be done by government. Right? It certainly isn't going to be done by government. Well, by it certainly <laughs> doesn't look like <laughs> it at the moment. I mean, actually, it's being done by some governments. I think, you know, Germany and Denmark are doing very interesting things. And there's some very interesting things happening in some South American countries with their whole Buen Vivir kind of thing where they're saying, no, actually, we, we see the way we want to develop our, our economy and the protection of nature and the biosphere as being, as being integral with each other. Whereas here and in the US, there's this sense of economic growth at all costs, never mind about climate change, never mind about other stuff. We've got to make this economy grow. It's like a hospital drama where they're giving someone that kind of electric shock thing to the chest, you know. Well, it's, and it also strikes me as you're, as you're talking that there's an inherent quality in the economic model that we have which is really divisive, that in a sense, we, the, the, the current economic and, and thus political model says, you're an individual, right? And, and we need to talk to you as an individual. And overlooks completely the fact that you live in a social context, that you have relationships with other people, that you're part of a family, a community, and so on. And sort of restoring that is an enormously powerful thing to do, which seems to me to be one of the great strengths of transition. Mm. Yeah. yeah, Margaret Thatcher once said, there is no such thing as society. And I think that uh, that belief has had a catastrophic impact ever since because a lot of politics has behaved as though that's the case. A lot of urban planning behaves as though that's the case. A lot of economics behaves as though that's the case. But inherently we know that's rubbish. You know, I mean, actually we are all social creatures and, and we thrive on that, you know. And that's what, I remember somebody, one time I was in Tooting in London, someone came up and said, even if nothing else happens through transition down Tooting, I've lived here 22 years, I've known this place so much deeper and richer. In the last two years I've been involved in transition than I did in the 20 years before. Another person said, you know, well I now know about, even if transition, it was in Lancaster I think, if transition Lancaster stopped tomorrow, you know, I know 200 people now that I didn't know before. And, and that's, that's so important. And that's where resilience comes from, you know, having those relationships. You know, we're, we live in a culture now where, you know, when I was a kid, if somebody said, how many friends have you got? I'd have to sit and have a bit of a think about it, you know. Now, kids just go on Facebook and go, 77, you know. But actually, they, they aren't, your friends are the people who come around and help you if your roof blows off in the middle of the night, you know, not people who tick a box on Facebook. And so I think that that kind of reconnection with, with culture and people and local place is really, really vital to everybody, I think. And people get that. You know, it's not like some wacky idea out of nowhere. And, um, yeah, people like to thrive and live in a place that's thriving. And we've you've become so used to just sort of limping along, really, I think. So in this context, recognizing, as I think we do at this point in the conversation, the power of... of of our wish to be together and to do things together, what does an economic blueprint for the town of Totnes look like? Well, I can't the show you. Phrase yet. seems a little funny. Right? Yeah, you know, yeah, right? I can't show you yet because it's uh, we haven't got it. It's, it's not quite. It'll be ready in about two months. But what it looks like is a very detailed mapping of the current economy in terms of food, in terms of the local business economy. You know, what are all the businesses in this town? What do they do? How much? Who are the biggest ones? Who are the smallest ones? What's the nature of the economy here? Where does our money go in terms of energy? How much money do we spend on energy every year? Where does that go? What kind of stuff do we spend that on? Um, where do we spend our money in terms of care, looking after the elderly here? Who, who does that go? No one's ever really done that before. So it's a very detailed mapping of that, which then means that we can start to identify the ways to, the opportunities that there is in terms of local, uh, the local community picking up on that and taking that on. So in terms of local food, what are the potential local businesses? What's lacking? You know, one of the things that's emerging is there's no real kind of food processing that happens here. There's farmers around who grow all kinds of different things. And then there's businesses in town who make maybe uh, soups and stuff for which they need uh, washed, uh, peeled and chopped vegetables, which at the moment they 
buy from Norwich because that's the nearest place that does it. Well, that's not a big bit of infrastructure. You know, what infrastructure do we need to better connect the farmers around us uh, with this place? Uh, what's the potential in terms of retrofitting our energy efficient building stock in this town? Uh, how much energy could we potentially generate around this community in such a way that it's owned by local people? And we have already have a community energy company here with 500 members that's just applying for permission for two wind turbines on the edge of the town. So an economic blueprint, I think, as much as anything, is all those key organisations coming together and saying, this is where we see the future of this town's economy being. Because there's all this pressure from government to build a new 400 more houses in this town and you've got to take this additional development. But no one's doing the thinking about what the economy to support all those people is going to look like. So that's what the idea of that plan is. But as I said before, the most powerful thing about it is that it's, it's not transition town Totnesses. It's the town councils and the district councils. And that's uh, the first time I know that anyone's ever done that anywhere. That really is the mark of, of your having permeated the place, right? Yeah. yeah. You, just, yeah. Just, you just kind of merged the, the transition initiatives with the town itself. Yeah, and I think transition in, in everywhere is, is designed with a, with a kind of an, an inbuilt humility to it, actually, you know, which says that you know, we don't need to be up front in the mix with this at all. You know, we can just be tucked away in the back you know, we, we're there to facilitate. It's not a work of enormous ego here where we have to have Transition Time Totnes branded on everything. We're really here to serve this process and uh, in whatever way we can, really. And in a sense, you, you almost have planned your own obsolescence, right? I mean, as this economic <coughs> blueprint shows, there comes a point when you can't really tell the difference between Transition Time Totnes and Totnes. It's, it's yeah. the same thing. I it? mean, ideally, the ultimate aim of Transition is therefore they're not to be Transition anymore. Yeah, because no it's just it. everywhere. It's become the way that we do things. Yeah, and, and that, uh, you know, when we started doing transition network, I made this proposal that so at that time the New Economics Foundation launched um, a campaign called 100 Months, where they said we've got 100 months to avoid runaway climate change. Uh, and then they kind of ticked down every month and suggested things that we should do every month. And I said I thought we should have an organisation that was actually linked to 100 Months and said we designed transition network to last for 100 months because if we haven't cracked it by the end of 100 months, we're toast anyway. Uh, I was the only person who thought that was a good idea, but I like just uh, instinctively, I like the kind of, um, I've always had a real admiration for bands who record the one perfect album and then go, do you know what, I don't think we're ever gonna top that. I think we'll just call it a day. And uh, uh, that kind of integrity I really admire actually. Well, Transition Network is, is, uh, is not so much a nonprofit, it's more of a consulting I'm not, that may, may not be the right word, but it's more of a source of uh, resources for... Yeah, it's kind of many things really. I mean, it's a charitable organisation, uh, but it also it runs training and it produces books and it produces videos and it produces all kinds of online resources and uh, it does it has a kind of a consulting arm to what it does as well. It's a, it's a very much evolved in service of, of, what, of what the people who are doing transition feel they need and tell us that they need and that's that, that's how we see our, our role really. And it sustains itself through these kinds of the sales of those kinds of products or? Mm, partly mm -hmm. I think you know it's also dependent on 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 funding from different organizations and some of that's related to particular projects and some of it just supports the general work that we do. I think um, I think we feel very very driven that actually we've created a network of thousands of communities in the UK and around the world and what we what we're able to offer to funders really is that we can disseminate ideas very quickly through those networks we can support those networks we can uh, you know we can really build on that and and support that so I think one of the things that the transition network offers to funders is that is that we uh, you know, we give most of our materials away, you know, our website is free access, the films that we make is, and the stuff we produce for transition initiatives is all freely given away. You know, then there's networks of volunteers around the world who translate it into all different languages and put it on their web stuff. So f I think funders like that they can really see the impact that it has. Um, but 
we decided quite early on that we didn't want to take a completely commercial route and charge all the transition initiatives for membership and have a membership program and all that kind of stuff and advertising on the website you know we felt that it was at this time what was needed was just to to make that stuff available because it's needed really urgently and quickly in as many places as it can get to and if you had gone the other way you wind up getting into a kind of an organizational blind alley where they, the, organize, the sustenance of the organization becomes the, uh, one of the major objectives of it. And yeah, yeah. And, and also we wanted to keep very small. Transition Network is about eight people. And I think if it got to double that size, it would feel like something was going a bit wrong, really. You know, the, that actually the, the role is really to catalyst, to, sorry, the role is really to catalyze what's happening out on the ground, not to big us, build us some big kind of empire here. Big element of trust that if you, um, I think it, uh, Tim Smith that calls it the Tinkerbell theory that if you if you build it, that people will come, or if you provide the opportunities, people will take it. But um, you, you, there's a la there's a lack of uh, you, you don't seem to feel the need for control over a lot of this stuff. It's much more much more like seeding things. And yeah. Well. The analogy I use actually increasingly now is it's like it's like mycorrhizal fungus. You know, so in in an undisturbed woodland, you have this incredibly fine uh, kind of fungus, mycorrhizal mush, uh, fungus. So if you had a, a cube about that big of, of soil, mycorrhizal rich soil, it would contain about ten miles of, of mycorrhizal uh, filaments running like that. And what it does is it, it's extraordinary. It forms like a kind of a neural network in the forest. It's how a forest sort of distributes its nutrients. It's how it communicates shock through the system. It's, it's what gives that ecosystem its resilience, really, is the mycorrhizal connections between everything. But, a lot, but usually it's just below the surface. And so people come here to Totnes, for example, and they come expecting to see the famous transition town Totnes and expecting some kind of eco Shangri-La with goats on the roof and no cars and windmills everywhere and stuff, you know. And actually, you have to explain that a lot of what transition does is it runs under the surface. It's about connection, it's about building relationships, it's about nurturing, all that kind of stuff. And then it will fruit in places, and s like on a, on a moist autumn morning, you'll get fruits of transition. And some of them are the things you expect, like the community energy company, some of them are the things you really didn't expect at all, like the town council passing a resolution to become a transition town council. You know, these things pop up. Sometimes are things you expect, sometimes are things you not, that you don't expect. But for me, the thing that then emerges from that is that the role of transition isn't to convince everybody about climate change, isn't to convince everybody they need to do anything. The role of transition is to inoculate the soil. It's to change the conditions, it's to change the culture of a place so that then those things uh, start to fruit. And that feels like a very, very different kind of mental picture than, than most of the activism that I've been involved in previously in the past. And the way that those insights have emerged out of actually just doing things, you know. So when we started doing transition here in Tottenham, people started coming really early and saying, what are you doing? How do you do it? What is, what is transition? And we would say, we have no idea. This is an experiment. You know, actually, we don't know how to do this, but collectively we can figure it out. So people doing transition all over the world are part of this experiment to figure it out. So we set out these things we call the 12 steps that felt like what people were doing at that stage. After three years, we then went back to everyone and saying, how's that 12 steps thing going? You know, and they said, well, we did the first one and we did the third one and then uh, we didn't like the fourth one and the fifth one we, we didn't really understand. So we did the sixth one and then we didn't do any of the rest. So we did some other stuff, you know, and actually people were developing their own way of doing it. So actually then in the, the most recent book we did, The Transition Companion, we actually well, said, so what are you doing? What are the ingredients of what you're doing? And what emerged was that what people are doing is much more like um, baking, in a sense. It's like cooking at the community level. So we can give recipes, uh, and it's like the invitation to make the most delicious cake you ever made. Well, everyone, there are certain stages to making a cake. You, 
you know, you have to do certain things to make a cake. But in every place, everyone's going to draw in on in the ingredients that appeal to them, that appeal to their tastes, that appeal to the local culture and traditions and the richness of the, of the cultural cuisines of those places. Everyone will make a cake which is distinct, which is different, which is the cake that they love, but they draw from common ingredients. So what we try to do is to map what those ingredients are, how people actually assemble them, is their own, uh, their own business. I didn't, I didn't ask you at the start about permaculture, and it, but, I, but as you spoke, I think you explained it to a considerable extent because I'm, 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 stru I'm struck by the, by the power of that mycorrhizal metaphor, but also by the fact that, that when you try to explain some of these social things, you move to biological metaphors. And, and you see us very much in a biological, not in a mechanistic context, but a biological one. Yeah, I mean, permaculture is something that really runs through transition because it's the kind of one of the underpinning ideas, it was where it came from really. I think in many ways, like how the great innovations in music happen when someone goes, what happens if I put this with this, you know, I've got, if I mix this James Brown record with this Led Zeppelin record and all of a sudden I've invented hip hop, you know, and uh, so transition was a bit like, uh, what happens if you put peak oil together with permaculture was the initial inquiry really, I suppose, where it came from. So permaculture I think is really like the, uh, the design glue that holds a sustainable system together. Uh, it's about how you maximise, someone once described it as the science of maximising beneficial relationships. And I think that's really what we try to do uh, in transition as well. So, um, But it's funny, it's one of those things, because I've been so grounded in permaculture for such a long time, and I was a teacher of it for many years, um, it's just instinctively the way I think about stuff. So it almost kind of took other people to come in and go, wow, that's really interesting. You know, actually the way you're communicating transition is like uh, how it is, you know, like insights from biology and ecology, and that's really interesting. And I'm just thinking, well, it's just permaculture, isn't it? Really? <laughs> isn't that obvious to everybody? But of course it's not. You know. Yeah, it's a powerful, powerful metaphor. And, it, and it's, uh, you know, you were saying this is about changing stories. That's, that's, there is a change in the story that I think is quite dramatic and, and, and works extremely well yeah. to explain what it is that you're doing. One final question. If somebody said to you, what's the most astonishing uh, phenomenon or story or episode or event that's come out of all of this ferment really around the world, what would you say? When, 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 has, when has something really rocked you back in your heels and made you say, wow, who imagined that was possible? I think one of the great um, blessings about being at the center of this transition thing is actually we have moments like that every week whether it's getting the transition whether it's getting an email from somebody who wants to set up transition Ulan Bator or some people who are musing over creating transition Tehran or an email I had last week from an order of nuns in America who also have orders of nuns in Japan and Chile and places asking for our permission to use their materials on their website because they wanted to encourage all of their nuns to become advocates for transition around the world. I think maybe for me actually one, one highlight would be the first unleashing, we call it an unleashing, is like the launch event of a transition initiative. Yeah? And uh, the first unleashing of a transition initiative in the Global South which uh, was in a place called Brasilandia in Sao Paulo, which is a favela in Sao Paulo, very, very impoverished uh, part of Sao Paulo, where some remarkable people had been doing transition there, had developed ways to teach transition to people who couldn't read, uh, had developed ways of transition being about social enterprise, new economy, building community, and had done extraordinary, extraordinary work there. And, uh, they, and they, had, they had their unleashing one Saturday morning and they asked me to be part of their unleashing. So I don't fly. I gave up six years ago flying as uh, sat in the back of the cinema watching An Inconvenient Truth thinking I'm not going to just leave the cinema not having done anything. What am I going to do? So that was my stopping flying moment. So I, pres so I participated in their unleashing by Skype. So Saturday morning I'm sat at home, breakfast table, uh, Skyping into this um, unleashing in this big kind of tent in the middle of this favela in Sao Paulo and there were lots of children running around and nuns and rappers and guys with big kind of feather headdresses and stuff and uh, all absolutely ecstatically excited about the idea that they were kicking off transition in their place 
and they were really excited about it. And there was this guy who did a transi transition rap in Portuguese, this young rapper guy. You just think, wow, this is just extraordinary. You know, this is some mad idea that we had in this little town in Devon, which we had no idea that it was going to work or gain any kind of attraction here. And now here we are a few years later, and here on the other side of the world, there's people who are going, this is, this is what we want to do. This is our future. And, and also the, the, the thing that you really see with transition people, wherever it is in the world, they're in this for the long haul. You know, people see this as being their life's work. This isn't something that they're going to pick up, do for six months and then move on to the next thing. People, this is, they want to make this happen. This has to happen. And, uh, you know, and as somebody who was involved in the cobbling together of this mad idea in this Devon town, it's, uh, it's something that's endlessly humbling and exhilarating and extraordinary to see. Rob Hopkins, founder and leader of the transition movement, which has inspired profound positive change in hundreds of communities all over the world. If you enjoyed this interview, you may want to look at our interview with the Honorable Jigme Finley, Prime Minister of Bhutan, who is leading his nation into a future where the measurement of success will be gross national happiness as opposed to gross national product. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. See you next time.